Hello everyone and uh, thank you to all the attendees for joining today's webinar. So I am Stéphane Lacamp, I work for Obeo and I'll be your moder moderator today. I just want you to inform everyone that uh, as we have a few attendees uh, to this webinar, your microphone is muted to avoid uh, any background noise. And after today's presentation, we will have a Q&A session. Please use the Q&A dedicated window to ask your questions during, the, during or, or after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Capella YouTube channel. So it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce our today's speakers. Uh, we have two speakers today and our first speaker is John Risson. He is an engineer manager and a senior system engineer with expertise in the design, implementation and operation of national communication network systems. He enables successful completion of a complex 1.1 billion uh, commercial network upgrade program by leading its systems engineering effort. He also assured delivery of a $1 billion government network by recommending design and operational interventions. He has over 22 years of experience in Australia and East Asia. Our second speaker is Fabrice Lestido. Over the last 16 years, he has been involved in the development of complex critical systems such as electronic warfare, maritime patrol, air traffic control and or heavy rail systems. In his roles as a system engineers, managers and solution architect, he has specialized in MBSC, providing training in the use of Arcadia or the Arcadia methodology and the Capella tool developed by Thales. Now working for the Victorian Department of Transport in charge of the development of a transport network architecture. He is also co-leading the development of a commercial tele telecommunication model for the INCOSI telecommunication working group. And without uh, further ado, ado, I'm going to hand over to John. So let me make you a presenter. John. Right, and you should have the presenters right now. John and Fabrice, the uh, virtual floor is yours. Thanks, Stefan. Um, before I let uh, John start the presentation, I wanted to quickly introduce myself uh, so people don't get surprised when I jump in the middle of the presentation. Uh, as Stefan mentioned, for the, the work we are presenting today, John was the domain expert and I, um, I was the MBAC expert. Um, I joined uh, John in the Incosi Telecommunication Working Group uh, that he chairs to develop the, the model with the objective to demonstrate the benefits of applying system thinking and model-based uh, approach to the telecommunication domain. Uh, this work was done voluntarily uh, after work and focused on producing a demonstrator model uh, that we could use to show the benefits of uh, systems engineering techniques to the telecommunication network providers. Um, over to you, John. Thanks very much, Fabrice. So, and thanks everyone for your time today. This talk's really for two distinct communities. One's the systems practitioners who use systems approaches to, to develop solutions for very challenging problems. The second community is the communications network community. And we're particularly talking with communications service providers. So these are currently quite separate communities. The telecoms community, it's long used systems design and analysis techniques. However, the, the proposition here today is that there's a lot that we can learn from each other. Our primary objective is to increase awareness and two-way learning between these communities. So, um, so, so why are we interested in this? Um, why do we have an international council of systems engineering um, working group set up to particularly for the telecommunications domain. It's because if we better apply these systems approaches to network development, we will better meet the needs of end users. So, so yes, communication service providers can stand to benefit their, their global revenues 
are about one and a half trillion dollars per annum. So yes, there, there's benefits there, but more fundamentally, as the last few months around the world shown, society depends on these communication networks now more than ever. Um, they underpin education and health and transport and business and defence and public safety. Um, so if we really care for outcomes about um, for people in all these dimensions, then we need to care about networks and how we build them. I just want to, before we get into it, just want to say a, a really big thank you to our colleagues in the INCOSI Telecommunications Working Group and also a, a thank you to OBO and in particular Stefan Lacromp for um, for access to the team for Capella, which we've been able to, it's been really helpful in a um, collaborative cloud-based version of it. So thank you, Stefan. Um, the talk comes in two parts today. So the first 20 minutes or so, I'll, I'll deal with the communication service provider perspective. Um, communication service providers solve some of the world's biggest communications problems, and they're complex transdisciplinary problems. Model-based systems approaches can help. Fabrice will pick up in the second part to demonstrate how Acadia methods can aid communications network development. And we'll look at ways in which they communicate um, consistent, complete, validated, engineered, end-to-end -end solutions. Then we'll have a few minutes for question and answer at the end. So the first part, the communication service provider perspective. Network development and networks are inherently complex. If you think about a communications service provider and some of the external stakeholders this is not at all a complete list, but so front and centre, we have the customer um, who could range from small consumer customers in very, very large numbers, small, medium enterprise, very large enterprise and government customers, so the full range. Um, there's every one of these interfaces here um, is very dynamic and the, it's the value that comes from those dynamic and changeable interactions. Um, take for example, in Australia, we've over the last decade, we've had a move to a national broadband network. So that was triggered by um, regulatory changes um, that's introduced completely new infrastructure service providers. Um, it's created new opportunities for competitors. Um, there's been, as always, no new network product gets to market unless um, regulatory and law enforcement considerations are taken to ground. Um, the, the threat, no matter how you measure it, um, the, the threat to the network um, of becoming more diverse and, and the risks from those threats are increasing all the time. So bottom line, complexity is here to stay. Um, our job as an engineering community is to make that complexity seem, um, seem simple and to resolve it. It doesn't go away. Um, there's inherent value from the changes on, on all of these interfaces. So the, the better we understand them, the better we understand the stakeholders and the interactions with the environment, the more value we can deliver. Networks are also complicated. And by complicated, we mean there's a large number of parts, there's a large number of part pines, and there's a lot of interactions and interfaces between those parts. So we've got billions of devices on the planet. Um, individual service providers would have um, hundreds of network element variants. They'll, they'll have hundreds, if not thousands of individual support systems for either network support, network service support or business support systems. 
Um, in terms of network functions, um, we're looking at hundreds of network functions. Um, 250 was a figure that was given by at and in the when in an efforts to virtualize network functions. Um, business functions, um, there is at least hundreds. The TM forum, when they detailed a few layers of a hierarchy of business functions, got up to about 2,000. So they're complicated. Uh, what's driving that complication? Um, ongoing capacity demands means the upgrades to the network are continuous. Um, in Australia, we've just had a 31% increase in bandwidth per user over the last couple of months, um, particularly because of the COVID situation. But more generally, um, it, it's often said that because of network growth, the network we have today is only 20% of the network we need in five years time. And if you think about an analogy of if that was the growth rate for a rail transport system or our road transport system, it's an incredible pace. Um, we only hit that pace and we only are able to maintain profitability by getting order of magnitude changes on cost per bit um, with every new generation of network kit that's coming along. So there's continual upgrades to, to next generation kit. Um, at the same time, um, it's very challenging to remove components and component types from the network. The, the business case most often says, um, keep the equipment, sweat the asset um, well beyond um, its um, end, at least its end of sale, if not its end of life. Um, there's also point operational issues. So networks are very dynamic, new capabilities coming into them all the time. So there'll be um, year in, year out, um, very challenging operational issues for which the, the easiest knee-jerk reaction will be to add new functions to the network or add new tools to the network. So that's the short term drivers. But in the long term, all communication service providers have technology roadmaps just to keep up with the capabilities that are going to be required in the future. Some of the items on their roadmaps are things like network virtualization, um, disaggregation of network elements, um, security improvements, 5G, and so low latency, um, high bandwidth mobile access. Um, Internet of Things um, to push into industrial applications, edge computing to move applications closer to the edge of the network for latency and flexibility advantages, artificial intelligence to, to help, become, help operations become more autonomous. All these things, they all increase component count, interface count, and function count. So, Complication also is here to stay, and it arises from the number and variety of network parts and their interfaces. I guess the, the third trait that we're looking at, network development is transdisciplinary. Any individual development team delivering a capability uplift, you'll you'll often see a core development team, ideally with the users, external users and internal operational users engaged directly in that team. You'll see a backbone of network engineers and software developers and network and IT architects and testers and facility engineers who look after um, power and infrastructure at, at massively distributed sites. That will often be the core of the team. Um, you'll have a range of management capabilities, some at the project level and some at the enterprise level to make sure that the business outcomes are in order. And there'll be a range of specialties. And there's a few there on the right, ranging from security and business process to, to user experience and, and data science. So bottom line, 
there's a whole lot of different capabilities required um, to assemble any individual network development. Um, so to get the best outcomes, we've got to communicate really well across these different disciplines and we've got to make the right decisions across the disciplines. We we're all taught at school and at, at undergraduate how to solve individual problems in individual domains, but network development is fundamentally across domains, it's fundamentally tra transdisciplinary. So how do we help that communication? We, we need a lot more than just natural language and we need a lot better than um, simple pictures and, and visio diagrams. A music analogy. Um, music is also a multidisciplinary exercise. Any orchestra is made up of many different kinds of instruments. Um, but at its core, the key concepts that bind good music together, there's only a few. There's things like melody and harmony and rhythm and dynamics. And they can, they can express extraordinary complexity. Um, so the, the question is, um, how do musicians to communicate? Yes, they use natural language. Yes, they work together. Um, but these concepts um, are more precise than that. And, and they're written down um, in visual ways on, on a musical score. Um, they're, they're, they're concepts that are written down and recorded and reused and improved and refined so that come performance time, the decisions can be made in very rapid fashion. So what are the similar key concepts that bind together network disciplines, despite the complexity? Um, and you'll, you'll just be patient with me. I, I know we're dealing with a few different kinds of audience here. Um, at its heart, the thing that distinguishes different approaches and the thing that distinguishes a systems approach are the systems concepts. So what do I mean by that? There's only a few things in a systems approach that really matter. There's a few key concepts. There's things that exist in, in green, and these are physical or informational things, their, their systems or subsystems or parts of the solution, and, and these have attributes and, and state. Um, then there's the items in blue, which, which uh, are things that happen. So processes and dynamic behavior, um, operations and functions. Then we have the interactions between those things, the relationships between them. So relationships between parts, um, relationships like consist of and exhibits and is a and is an instance of, um, relationships between um, the objects and their processes. So things like consumes and yields and changes and handles and requires. Point is, Arranging those is a lot more complex than a breakdown structure. When in a systems approach, when we really talk about structure, we're talking about the rich dynamic interactions between all those parts. And the part, by parts, we mean people and hardware and software and procedures, resources and facilities. So, so these, are, these are the core concepts that integrate the network disciplines. Um, systems approaches also give us hierarchy and ways to, and, and abstraction, so ways to simplify all of that so we don't have to think of all the parts at any given time. Bottom line, why have a systems approach? Um, there's merit in our delivery outcomes. So from a financial point of view, um, if you invest 
about 7% of development budget it's been shown and that's much less than you'd often spend on on a network project on fixing the faults then the development cost um, at, on average drops by over 20 percent there's delivery outcomes so if you with that small investment you're likely to deliver on time the likelihood increases by over 50 percent but underneath all of that it's the benefit for the end user that really motivates us in the in cozy working group um, traditionally today whether it's in the standards groups or in the communication service providers there'll be a great volume of textual descriptions so architecture specs um, textual test descriptions There'll be diagrams through it, um, often created in Visio through Word and PDF documents. Um, we need to be learning from many other advanced technology industries and figure out how to simplify this complexity, how to be able to extract simple views from very complex systems and be able to drive them forward. Um, so, for a communications service provider, what's the potential benefits um, of looking at systems approaches in general and model-based systems approaches in particular? Um, one of them is reduced risk, and I'll just draw your attention to just one of those bubbles on the screen there of, of um, early simulation and early verification. If you're dealing with with reams of textual descriptions, ultimately you're relying on hope and you're at risk with human error in ensuring that you've got the complete combination of um, functions and threads and parts acquitted across. Whereas in models, long before you get anywhere near an, an implementation, even an iterative implementation, you're able to start proving that end-to-end -end thread um, at architecture time. Um, you're able to simulate it at architecture time. Um, you're able to verify completeness with a range of checks which are automated to make sure, as an aid to the human designer, have we missed anything? Are there any functions we've missed in the particular parts? Are there any variants we've missed? Um, are there any um, operations modes that we've forgotten about. We're able to improve the quality. So um, take one of the big challenges is just how do we hook those different roles, so the people who specify, the people who architect, the people who configure, the people who test together. Um, models pr provide a great way of establishing those linkages throughout the project. Um, they, they go a long way to improve what the systems community um, calls traceability. They go a long way to tie those things together to get the development team on one page. In terms of productivity, it, it helps move us out of, of single shot mode with a, with a single architecture description being written for a particular upgrade and then largely, it's not, not always the case, but often just because of the nature of it, um, it's hard to change and it's often a throwaway artifact. Models, if we pitch them at the right level, we can get closer to, to, to reuse. So bottom line, um, there are multiple ways in which models can help to fix problems earlier. own modes where design is say it will take nine to 12 months to design a new variant of a train those those times are being reduced back to three months um, similar sorts of um, schedule reduction it, it's it's well likely to be achieved 
by communication service providers. The same can be said for architecture time and verification time through re reuse. Um, by flushing out the problems earlier, like we saw on the last slide, that there's massive improvements, that those big mistakes um, that are made on day one or made at architecture time, they can be flushed out earlier. There's big improvements that that means for, for the risk profile and the end outcome for the customer. So, so bottom line, if these models give us a way to solve problems incrementally and solve them early. Now the demonstration we're about to step, step through, what, what's, what's a very high level um, model that a network engineer or a telecoms IT specialist will have in their mind when thinking about the, a communications network solution. It'll often be broken into a few parts um, and the size of each of these parts will depend on what one's domain's bias. Um, we'll have digital storefronts where 40% or more of the engagement with end customers is done through online. Um, we'll have this the network itself, which is the bit that um, the network vendors and network specialists will concentrate on. And then we have a very complicated bit in between. Those hundreds, if not thousands, of support systems in the network service management area. That's an area that provides things like fault management, configuration management, billing and accounting, performance and security management. So, so all those functions, while they, while they have appear at all layers to some extent, it's that network service management function where that needs to be brought together for internal and external users. And, and the bottom line on that is each of those networks can be broken out. So the networks into a hierarchy of access edge into the core of the network with um, the physicals of transmission and facilities underneath that. Um, and network service management, um, bits of that will concentrate on end-to-end -end services and bits of that will concentrate on particular network domains. Um, Modelling isn't new to, to the telecoms community. Um, a quote here from the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, um, the work, their working group that looks at that, that network service management layer or, or the, the ZSM working group. Um, they have recognised explicitly the ways in which models aid portability and reusability and, and give communication service providers options with respect to vendors. Um, so, just bottom line, this, this is really just to set the scene um, and give the systems community a helicopter view only of what the world looks like for communication service providers and some of the challenges. Um, but I hope you've got a taste for the ways in which systems approaches generally and model-based approaches in particular can help them solve some of the world's biggest problems. Fabrice, Fabrice at that point, over to you. Thanks, John. Um, so before diving into the model, I'll uh, quickly introduce the method um, and uh, wanted to emphasize on the fact that we'll, uh, we'll focus on, on the use of functional chains, um, which is a specific concept to Arcadia uh, and, and their benefits. <laughs> so the um, Arcadia is a, a method that has been developed by Thales, uh, a French group specialized in uh, delivering complex and critical systems, uh, both in civilian and, and, and military domains. Uh, it's been used successfully within Thales for more than a decade now, um, but also outside Thales, since the method uh, and, and the supporting tool uh, have been made uh, open source and supported by OBO. Uh, so the domain of, uh, of use, um, a range from uh, space, maritime patrol, maritime surveillance systems. Um, there are some, some uh, work done in transport, uh, 
with driverless trains and autom autonomous driving systems. And uh, I believe that uh, Hyperloop is, uh, is uh, looking into uh, using um, Arcade and Capella as well, and uh, some nuclear plant systems. Uh, air traffic control systems have um, also used um, use this method, and um, and the associated voice control systems um, have been uh, developed successfully using using that method. Um, next, so. Before we start, um, I'll go quickly through the, the, the four steps of, of the method for the people who are non-experts, non-Arcadia experts. Uh, the, the first step focuses on analyzing the customer's needs and a goal at the top here uh, called operational analysis. Um, and it, it focuses also on, on delivering the expected mission and activities of the different actors. Um, the outcome of this phase consists in uh, an operational architecture defining um, actors or future users of the systems, operational scenarios and operational capabilities. Um, the second step uh, called system analysis, um, see the systems appear for the first time as a black box. It defines the system capabilities, the context with the interfacing users, systems, entities. Um, this is where we, we define the, the system functions and external interfaces. We we'll also perform an unknown function analysis, such as safety or security analysis at this level. And that's, that's from, from that level that um, you generate your system specification. <clears throat> uh, the third phase, logical architecture, uh, focuses on, on defining a, a first level of solution, uh, excluding technical or, or technological solution or issues, sorry. Um, this is where you start decomposing your system into logical components and start defining internal interfaces between these components and continue your functional and non-functional analysis and start performing trade-offs. Um, the last phase, the physical architecture, describes how the system uh, will be developed and built. Um, you introduce the notion of nodes, specific deployments, notions of functional scenarios, states and modes, Components are present throughout um, all of these phases. <clears throat> so the Arcadia key concepts, um, before I run through the example of the model, it's important that we introduce uh, Arcadia. Um, so we start with the notion of capability, which is central. Um, <clears throat> the capabilities are, um, are described by, by functional chains and scenarios. Um, and, and functional chains scenarios, um, uh, they they are uh, a set of uh, interrelated functions and, and functional exchanges that uh, focus on a, uh, often an end to end end to end view. Um, we we introduce a notion of actors and, and components that implement the functions, um, and actors and, and components interact with each other through component exchanges. Uh, that supports the, the functional exchanges. Um, that these two elements, functional exchanges, component exchanges, and exchange items, uh, with their data definition, enable generation or definition of interfaces, um, and states and modes um, are also important to uh, um, to define the behavior of uh, of the, the system. <coughs> So if we go next, um, the tool that, um, that supports and that we've used um, is Capella, and, and for obvious reason, uh, first one is uh, there was expertise in in uh, in the uh, the group uh, in 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 Capella, so it, it became obvious for us to use this, um, and um, we also, as John was saying, wanted to thank OBO for the support and and the use of team for, for Capella uh, that enabled us to, uh, to work remotely, John and, and, and myself. Um, so if we go to the next uh, page. Um, so our original objective for this model was to focus on developing a, a baseline uh, from which uh, to manage change. Uh, that's, that's, that's what we wanted to, to demonstrate. Uh, with a full baseline representing the system of interest, uh, one is able to do uh, impact analysis on the change, but also come up with the right de decisions uh, much more quickly than with traditional approaches. 
Um, so here we, we, we can see uh, um, the main mission of uh, uh, the communication system, which is providing communication services. Uh, and and we've uh, we've highlighted um, uh, major capabilities um, that enable that mission to be uh, to be delivered. We're going to uh, we're going to focus on two um, on two specific capabilities: operate communication solution and, and deliver communication. So um, I'll run you through um, uh, a top down through a top down approach uh, that starts at, at system level here. Um, and uh, and we focus on these capabilities, uh, the actors involved, uh, functional chains that support these uh, or define these capabilities and, and uh, the different functions uh, involved. So <clears throat> here is a representation of some of the uh, uh, external actors, entities, uh, users, systems uh, that interact with the com commercial communication system. and. Um, um, in red here, we've got um, the customer that uh, interacts with uh, with the system for the operate communication solution, and for the um, second capability, we'll uh, focus on the customer and the internet. So we we've chosen two functional chains, one uh, per uh, per capabilities uh, presented here. Um, so the operate communication solution uh, will will demonstrate um, the how how we go about with the, the use of a functional chain, which is called customer get service, uh, which is pretty self explanatory. And for deliver communication, we've got customer uses service. So <clears throat> here is a um, for commercial communication system, which is. Uh, very large. Um, we've got uh, a set of, of functions that are well known: um, uh, deliver communication, uh, secure communication products, manage network capacity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we, we're going to focus on three of these functions: uh, top-level functions, deliver communication, which supports uh, uh, the delivery of uh, a communication service, and activate communication product and offer communication product. <coughs> so. Um, what you see here is the, the system of interest. Uh, so at the bottom there, we've got commercial communication system. Um, and uh, we're showing four, four of these functions. Um, we have the customer here and the internet represented as actors um, and uh, interactions between the system and, and these, uh, these customers. So if we um, if we start diving into the notion of functional chain, a uh, specific functional chain that I mentioned before, um, and, and if you start building your model thinking in terms of functional chain, this is the type of result you get. Uh, so for customer get service, the story is about uh, enabling the customer to find his communication product. So we start on the left here, um, this product requests. Um, the co commercial communication system can provide a product list. Um, there's a, a product quote request from the customer, and and uh, the quote is uh, is provided back to the customer. Uh, he can then do a, a product order, and uh, and and the system will provide a, a product confirmation. On the right side, we've got the customer uses service um, after his. His, uh, his product is activated, um, and it's about communication and uh, um, exchange of data between the system and <coughs> the internet. So, if we go, uh, if we go next, we're going to dive into uh, the logical architecture, John. Um, and um, so, uh, as you saw, uh, the functional chains that were represented there were uh, pretty simple. And the, the objective here is really to focus on what the system delivers out. Um, it's not about the detail of what's happening within the system. Um, when we get to the logical architecture, um, so for that, that type of system, it's very large, uh, we've, we focused on, on three, uh, three main components, the digital storefront, network service manager, and the network. Um, so if we go back to the three functions of, of interest here, uh, deliver communication, activate, and offer products, um, 
basically the um, based on Jones knowledge. So so we we were not building a system from scratch. Uh, based on Jones knowledge uh, and the logical components that uh, we presented earlier, uh, we've refined the functional chains um, that I've presented and. Um, and and achieve uh, this functional decomposition. So activate communication product uh, is decomposed into uh, well, each of these functions uh, are decomposed into a set of uh, of sub functions that um, uh, the communication experts uh, will be happy to to look at and uh, and and, um, and and provide comments on. Uh, I'm sure. So <clears throat> if we um, if we look at how uh, this applies. Uh, onto uh, the logical architecture. Uh, so we see that uh, which logical functions are involved uh, in the customer gets service functional chain. Um, and it demonstrates the, the progressive approach of the method and shows how we can ensure the end to end service delivery is maintained throughout the solution definition. So, so basically, if you, if you keep on, on, on going, um, John, just to show the functional chain. Um, so that functional chain customer get service uh, is, is basically the same one as the one you've seen at, at system level, but you can see that the number of functions involved has increased uh, drastically, went from two to uh, uh, more than ten. And and, um, and 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 basically what that what that shows is that we are able to uh, to follow the thread. Uh, through the different uh, components and ensure that the end-to-end -end service is still delivered uh, applying this method. Um, if you go further, we're not showing interfaces here, but, um, oh, sorry, if you, if you, um, if you follow this um, approach, uh, your interfaces are justified by the functional exchanges. So interfaces between uh, the different components here uh, will uh, support each of the functional exchanges that are going between components. Uh, the other thing that I uh, wanted to, to, sorry, John, I wanted to talk about is, is that we've, um, we've decided to split that functional chain customer get service into four sub functional chains. And the reason for this is uh, to uh, manage complexity. Uh, but also to support uh, further VNV activities. Uh, we'll talk about it a bit later, but each of these functional chains, um, they're not only used for the system definition, but they'll also be used um, uh, for uh, defining test cases. So the work is done uh, from the start, from the descent of the V, if you want. If we go next, we've got the same, uh, the same, um, Principle applied to customer uses service. Uh, as you can see here, the, the layout is slightly different, but the, um, <clears throat> the the component of interest in this case is the network in the center, which is part of the system. And we've got the uh, user that uh, we've decomposed into uh, uh, three different uh, actors, the customer, user host, and, and user equipment. And, and we, we keep the internet on the right. Uh, so same principle, functional chain end to end, uh, and and then decompose into three sub functional chains to manage complexity and um, and uh, support the test cases. If we go next, um, we're going to dive into the, the physical architecture, um, and again um, dive into uh, uh, increasingly uh, more complexity. So um, here we've got basically the, the components that um, uh, John was mentioning previously. Um, and uh, it was just to prove that the, the tool can support uh, the same type of representation. Uh, so we've got the transmission network, core network, access network, edge network, and, and control plane. Um, this is just a decomposition of the network component. Um, so the, the edge router uh, might have hundreds of different variants in communication service provider network, for example. And um, we can talk uh, about, um, about how the 
the, the tool can support all of these variants um, and, and their usage. Um, resilience is, uh, is often an issue uh, for, for, for these type of components. Uh, it's therefore important to manage this, uh, uh, the functions that these components perform appropriately. So if we, <clears throat> if we dive uh, a bit further into the decomposition, so it, I, I know it's a bit hard to read, but um, the, the objective here is not to, uh, to dive into each of these components, but it's, it's more to show the, uh, the methodology and uh, we provide access to the, uh, to the model for everyone who's interested in, in looking into it in, in more detail. But basically the same concept applies. Uh, we've got uh, each, um, most of these components, uh, network service manager has been split into two subcomponents. Uh, and the network into uh, more subcomponents, and we've allocated and split uh, each of the functions to these uh, subcomponents. And the functional chains uh, get uh, get even more complicated, um, but we ensure that the end-to-end -end service is still delivered. So there is continuity between the system level and and the physical representation. <clears throat> the same applies for customer uses service. Um, um, I won't go into the, the, the domain-specific detail. I'll let uh, uh, John discuss uh, discuss that uh, later. If you've got any question on this, what, what we so we've continued <coughs> um, in in the decomposition further uh, using the notion of deployment nodes. Um, and and what are deployment nodes? They uh, they are um, the more physical representation, if you want, that can be used for um, uh, representation of, uh, of of places, for example, or specific uh, specific components, physical components, elements, and each of these behavioral components that you can see here, the uh, in the dark blue uh, component of the system, uh, can be deployed on, uh, on on specific deployment nodes, and uh, based on this deployment, we can um, we can apply some variants. Um, so the John John would will be able to talk about the, the complexity and the number of variants there are in, in each of these uh, these elements. Um, but basically, based on this core representation, we're able to represent uh, real physical um, deployment on your network, basically. So if we go next, <coughs> we'll um, we can see that uh, with, with such a, an approach and, and, and a tool we can generate uh, different types of, of views. Um, this one is generated for free. So basically what that means is the functional change that we've used to develop the model is, um, uh, is used to generate a, a scenario of this type. So it's the same elements that you've seen before. And if we go next, we've got um, States and modes that are important um, and that um, are used to refine the behavior of the system. Um, and if we continue, we've got um, a data definition, which is key for um, performance analysis, but also for uh, a threat analysis and for uh, definition of uh, the exchange items that are shared through these functional exchanges that. Uh, that we've showed you. So how does this help with the cost reduction, time to market and resilience? Um, so requirements are the results of, a, of a, an analysis, in our case, a functional analysis uh, and that the model supports. So effectively, model elements are requirements. Um, and, and, and what we're showing is that, uh, so if the next, uh, the model that you see at system level will be the uh, representation of your system specification and at physical level will be the representation of your uh, of your component uh, uh, specification and um, uh, being able to update a model is a lot easier and faster than um, updating a, a requirement set and, and uh, ensuring that that this these changes is uh, Coherent, consistent, and, and it's going to work. So, if we if we look at um, the relationship between functional chains and uh, and test cases, if, if functions are traced, linked to requirements, um, and these functions are used for for functional chain definition, 
uh, then you can see that the test cases, which are part of test procedure, uh, are also traced to the requirements themselves. And so you are able to, to do all of your tests, uh, uh, the, um, uh, test work based on the functional chains that have been defined through uh, the definition of your system. And in this case, we've got uh, these functional chains that you can see here. If we go next. Um, so how do you do, uh, how do you improve resilience? Well, you can do security threat analysis. Um, uh, in, in this case, you focus on the edge of your system. Um, um, and, and basically, if you've got all your functional exchanges and the, the data definition, uh, the exchange items uh, associated with these functional exchanges, um, it's a lot easier for a security expert to um, to assess the impact of uh, of uh, an attack on on the system uh, through this means that looking at at specific documentation and uh, hundreds of uh, of uh, other architectural diagrams. So other benefits span from interface generation. Um, so that's that's a big uh, that's a big driver for developing this type of of system as well, especially in a in a software domain. Uh, so you can simulate and you can validate your assumptions early. You can perform trade-off analysis, which is one of the key drivers for for this method. Um, <clears throat> and and you can use specific viewpoints for that. Uh, you can do impact analysis. So if you've got a baseline like uh, we, we've shown you here, um, and you can basically assess uh, the the, uh, the future needs that you've got and 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 see what will need to be changed uh, at your eventually your physical uh, layer and ensure that um, basically you've uh, um, you've achieved that that need and, and assess if uh, you've got any uh, any impact on the rest of the of the system, which is often often missed. Safety analysis, same as for security. Uh, you can re generate requirements, uh, interface generate interface requirements uh, easily generated, and same goes with uh, functional and non-functional requirements. And and uh, you can document, uh, you can produce documents based on the on the model base. Um, so you you end up with a, a recurrent specification and architecture uh, design documents that are consistent with each other. And that saves time. Uh, over to you, John. Cool. So where do we go as a telecommunications working group um, to to improve and leverage some of these capabilities? Um, where, how would a communication service provider um, pick the best aspects of the approach to deliver value? So we, you can't go wide and deep at the same time. Take the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, for example. They've got of the order of 50 working groups and most of those would be, have their own reference architectures, which would describe an aspect of the solution or an aspect of the architecture that the communication service provider has to deal with. So there's tens, if not hundreds of problems or questions that could be taken on, but they range from questions at the, at the enterprise level. So I've got a solution which is continually changing. Which bits do I invest money in? And they, and there's questions on particular concerns for particular parts of the solutions. So in, in this part of my network, um, these are the functions that have historically caused me resilience issues and, and brand damage. Um, what do I need to do to remediate them? Um, how not to use the modeling approaches? Um, do not start at the bottom left corner of that screen with a create the model and, and start playing. The right place to start, um, as in all systems approaches, is to frame the problem and, and make sure you have a good understanding of who's going to use the outcomes, outputs of the modeling development solution or the outputs of the systems approach. Um, 
what's the scope? What are the boundaries around that problem statement? Um, what's the inputs and, and information and data that's required? And, and what are the views and products that will help all of the different network development stakeholders um, along a develop, an iterative evolutionary development journey? Um, so, so bottom line, it is a journey and it, and it isn't going to be a, a, a single instance, a single deployment that's going to instantly give all of the benefits that we've just touched on and many others. Um, it, it requires an iterative learning journey. Um, the working group within INCOSI, so about 14 application working groups working in all the domains that, that Fabrice touched on earlier, um, but this one concentrates on particularly on applying some of the classic systems approaches to the telecommunications domain. We've got two sub projects running at the moment, one which um, spawned this piece of work, and that's particularly for the commercial communication service providers view. Um, but we have others that are also working in the critical communication sector. So areas that touch on public safety um, and all the functions involved in operation of emergency networks or disaster management, um, emergency management functions. Um, so we, we've got um, a whole series of events and publications coming out of both streams. We do have every Thursday morning, um, Australian time, Wednesday afternoon, US time, we, we do have um, a weekly working group meeting um, every quarter where we're having presentations and publications that are being produced out of this. Um, it's, the objective isn't to become a telecommunication standards group in its own right. Our overall objective is to improve delivery outcomes um, by this two-way sharing um, of um, the body of knowledge on systems approaches with telecoms domain um, knowledge. And by sharing, we're able to get to better outcomes faster. Um, if you're interested in participating, um, please contact me on that email address or find us on the INCOSI pages as well. So I've demonstrated the Acadia method. Um, at a very high level and, it, and its functional chains in particular and how they can help architects, designers, testers um, with the development of a, of a commercial communication solution. Um, in the other project we've got running on critical comms, they are also majoring on the same model-based systems approaches. Um, why, are we, why are we bothering? Why do we care about this? Because we fundamentally believe that these good um, opportunity for improvement by having these two communities rub together in a way that will improve the outcomes for society. Um, at that point, I'd like to thank you very much for your time and we'll throw it open to question and answer. Thank you, uh, John and, and Fabrice for, for this presentation. Um, so we, we've got a few questions and uh, if you're interested in uh, asking questions, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, please use the Q&A window uh, that, that you can open to do so. Um, uh, yeah, we, we are running a little bit out of time, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you some questions. So the first question I've got is what would be a good problem framing example for MBSE? Sure. Um, they could, they could, there was a really great paper produced by James Martin, um, which illustrated the problem framing and the reference was on the earlier slide, it'll be on the slides that are out there, um, which illustrated the application for the North American um, Weather Bureau, NOAA, um, and, and they, they started, he just, in that paper, he described both his process of going through 
but also the specific problem statement. And the specific problem statement there, and it's a very similar one um, in, in communication service providers, is specific problem statement was um, at the enterprise level of how do I know um, which, of the, which are the parts and the functions that I need to invest in to optimise the return on my investment. And a lot of these solutions, that they are across many different domains. So even, even the solution we've, we've just stepped through, we've ignored the interactions with infra infrastructure service providers, we've ignored the, the interactions um, with the vendors and, and, the, and, and the cloud service providers as well. Um, those interactions mean there's a lot of churn there. Um, we've, we've got to be able to know where to spend our money. Another, another point example, the problem statement might be, how do we grip up resilience? So there's parts of the network, be they in the authentication parts of the network or, or in, or in um, how routing information at layers two and three are shared around. Um, there's parts there which have very high consequences for resilience. Um, some of those parts have external exposures. And so to be um, driving either at design time or test time ways to reduce those risks. Just two examples, um, a communication service to, to, to work through this, this properly, there'd be one to 200 questions to ask on different kinds of problems to be able to prioritise and make progress. Um, if I may add to this, um, the good problem framing is the one that um, that basically each organisation is, is going to is going to have. So the the, um, the um, this type of model can support a lot of uh, um, uh, you know provide a lot of benefits, uh, but um, uh, in reality, um, you want to focus on a specific specific problem, um, and uh, and usually these problems uh, come a posteriori. So um, the reason why uh, Thales has uh, has come up with this type of, of approach is because they wanted to uh, um, to be more more efficient uh, in delivering their their problems and and reduce the cost of of rework, for example. So there's there's there's, there's many uh, many many problem framing. Okay, next question I've got is uh, also kind of a, a high level question. Uh, is uh, MBSC application in telecom domain different from other domains? Well, in, in this case, we, we've we've applied the same we've applied the same principles uh, as the one that um, I've applied in the past in. Uh, in aerospace um, or even in uh, in, in transportation, um, the the uh, Arcadia method is uh, is cross domain. So uh, in this case, again, Thales is a group, and uh, and they didn't focus on one specific domain. So uh, uh, in our case, we believe, and and it's uh, it's been presented to some uh, telecom uh, domain experts. We believe that the approach presented here is applicable to uh, uh, to telecom. Now, is there any specificities? Um, uh, from what I've seen, um, there would be minimum, but this, this, I guess it, there might be some, John. Yeah, what, one one way to look at it is there are there are differences between the systems approaches that are applicable in different domains. Um, the the view that we've just taken for communication service providers, um, it's definitely operating at that capability systems level rather than at a product systems approach level. Um, and, and there'll be there'll be similarities um, in that respect between between the communications service providers and say the transport service providers. Um, there'll be there'll be differences with say the medical device providers or the defence, um, the defence um, equipment providers. Um, we've just looked at at the at a communication service provider view, but in the heart of 
the telcos vendors, the same approaches have been used for decades, um, often in-house. Um, but it, so I'd, I'd say the differences are, are more uh, more at the systems approach level rather than the tooling level. Yeah. Okay, uh, I've got a series of questions which are more related to some uh, features of the tool. So the first one is how are models stored and searched and how is version control managed? So, um, I mean, that's that's very generic. Um, like, uh, for Capella and, and for many other other tools, um, uh, you can query your model. So it's a <clears throat> it's a very good question. Is the 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 way people must look at a model is uh, it's not just a series of of drawings. It's uh, it's in reality a, a graph, an underlying graph, and and you're building a graph, and um, and and graphs can be queried and uh, can be navigated through um, and. Um, so Capella, Capella enables uh, enables querying uh, about storing the model. Um, well, it's it's like any uh, you can use any configuration management um, uh, tool um, to do that. Um, and the version control manage same principle. <coughs> uh, you can you can simply do exports of your of your model and uh, and use any CM uh, CM tool to do that. Uh, Capella, uh, in particular, has some add-ons. I'm not sure if they're uh, open source uh, that enable comparison between models. Uh, so you can you can manage uh, you can control the change like this. Uh, but the same principle applies for any any tool and any type of model. Okay, thank you, Fabrice. Uh, are there import features in Capella to manage large amounts of data for model converts? So, um, model convert. So, if I understand correctly, is converting from one model to the next. Uh, maybe that question could be refined. Um, and and defining large amount of data is also a, is also a, a good uh, a good question. Um, I wouldn't say that Capella is tailored for managing very large amount of data. Um, like enterprise architect may be more uh, more effective at that potentially. Um, what requirements management tools are used in conjunction with Capella? I don't know if you used one in the context of this project actually. Uh, no, so that that's some of the future uh, activities that we can uh, look into. Uh, there is some uh, for light requirements definition. Uh, there is a. Uh, uh, a requirements capability within uh, within embedded within Capella. Um, there are also ways to link Capella with doors, um, and maybe uh, Stefan, you will be uh, better on answering this question. Uh, yes, uh, we are also uh, developing integration between Capella and and, and Team Center requirements, uh, and and a few other requirements tools as well. So there are. Definitely different ways to uh, integrate Capella with some requirement management tools. Um, maybe a quick question uh, for you, Fabrice. The next question is: What is the difference between a capability and a function? Yeah, so that's a very good question, um, <clears throat> and, and I, uh, I presume that the question was was asked because of uh, what we've presented today. Um, the 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 system that we've looked at here is a, is an enterprise. It's a really large system, so. The relation between uh, the capabilities and, and the functions uh, could be could be close, um, but the uh, capabilities are, are performed uh, uh, or are realized by a set of uh, of functional chains, if you want, so a set of services, uh, and and your your system will need to have a number of functions that will um, support this uh, capability. But usually a capability is uh, represented by uh, the external actors that are going to use or be involved in this capability. Um, the components, the interfaces, um, uh, and, and the functions uh, that are performed uh, to achieve that capability. 
Capabilities are very important, for example, if you want to, uh, to manage a product, a product line, uh, and you want to be able to sell uh, a system with different variants uh, to different customers, and you want to be able to manage uh, which functions are part of which capabilities and which components are, are part of which capability. That's, that's central to the, uh, the approach. Okay, thank you, Fabrice. Um... Another interesting one, does the Arcadia method have a collection of reference architectures? So that's a question and, and I may uh, extend it to uh, the work you are doing within your INCOSI working group. Uh, is it intended to be shared uh, with the community? I mean, the model that you are creating. So yes, the, the model we're creating is absolutely being done um, in the public domain. Um, reference architectures, um, there are a myriad of them out there in the comms domain. And, and so part of the reason for having this event is looking for feedback. Um, where are the, the most acute problems that people would like to concentrate on? So yes, we're, we're, we are starting conversations with the standards groups in that we would be very keen to touch some of those um, forward-looking technology reference architectures, so some of the technologies you saw on an earlier slide, um, but we're, we're also open to solving um, today's problem. So rather than having a technology driven, have it driven from the operational needs from comm service providers right now. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Fabrice, going back to one of the previous question about um, uh, in, importing uh, data. Um, so, so the question was maybe more target, targeting to con converting data, maybe external data directly in, into models. So maybe data that would be available as a textual file or an Excel file or CSV file or things like that. Um, yeah. Well, I guess you can answer that question, but yeah, the, the, there are there are capabilities to import and export uh, data into Capella. Um, uh, maybe you want to extend more on that, uh, Stefan, because uh, you have, you have used uh, status specific tools and, and open source tools, and I'm a bit confused of what's available and what's not uh, in the public domain. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's yeah i guess it's more technical questions but there are ways to import data uh, uh, automatically uh, some of they may uh, involve a little bit of uh, uh, coding like a few lines of codings but there are i mean capella is is using uh, the emf uh, uh, framework so it's quite easy to import uh, data into into EMF. There are a lot of APIs to do that. Basically, um, next question is: How would the safety analysis be done using Capella? Is, is there a good example case to review that? So it is safety analysis is done uh, using Capella. Uh, there's many ways of of doing it. You can <clears throat> um, just by analyzing the model. So if you have a, a safety uh, a safety uh, expert. Um, you can work on a model rather than work on a, a system specification, for example. Um, uh, there are also uh, viewpoints that I know have been developed uh, and used um, uh, on Capella. So what is a viewpoint? It's an add-on to uh, the, the Capella tool itself and um, uh, what it enables you to do for safety is, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm not a safety expert, but if you've got uh, uh, different safety levels um, and uh, depending on the safety level you're, you're requiring uh, at, at system level, um, the tool can tell you if you've got enough redundancy, for example, uh, within your solution. And the redundancy can be done through uh, do you need two functional chains? Uh, do you need uh, two functional chains that go uh, through two distinct components? Um, and this type of this type of thing. So that um, now I don't know if there. I don't think there are viewpoints available 
um, in the public domain yet. Uh, Stefan, you might, you might uh, correct me on this, uh, but you can do the analysis on the model as a safety uh, safety expert, and in theory, should uh, it should be a lot be a lot easier than uh, than looking through uh, distinct documents. But it's not in theory. It's true. Yes, and please contact me. I, I, I may be able to send you a few pointers to some uh, uh, people working on, on this topic. Uh, maybe one last question, interesting one. Uh, what is important to maintain the version of a system model and the actual system being the same? It's, it's crucial. It's crucial. I, I, ideally, ideally um... You know, for software software systems, for example, ideally you you would generate your interfaces um, <clears throat> on the model based on the model. So so you ensure that the solution you've got out there is uh, is based on the model. But it's, it's the same question as uh, how important is it to maintain the description of you know specification of the system or, or the, the the description of the system uh, compared to the the system that's um, actually uh, being deployed okay. it's the same so, so so the question is what is important to maintain so uh, what is, there is part of the question <laughs> of what 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 is important to do to make sure that you maintain both uh, a create yeah so so Sometimes that will depend on on what you're using the model for um that there's there might be one model model use where to get reuse you're just wanting to capture the those stable high level functions that don't change very much at all and are common across all the variants um, the tight coupling that Fabrice touched on earlier is when you might want to take this model and translate it at runtime into orchestration solutions. Um, the, the, what you need to have coupled between the two depends a lot on which of those two applications of the model. Yes, that's right. Uh, uh, apologies for misunderstanding the question, but yeah, it's the usage of the model that will uh, define how uh, important it is to maintain it. First question was: Do you use extra plugins or software to complement the safety analysis? So um, you can. Um, uh, you can also work without uh, specific uh, plugins to do that. Um, and there's a, a middle ground, which is um, if you export your data um, in a specific way, the interesting data. Um, then you can also do, uh, if you want to do semi-automatic analysis, you can do that uh, through, uh, through Excel uh, from, from exporting. Um, there are some viewpoints that uh, exist. I don't know if they are widely available that, um, that perform quite uh, complex safety analysis um, uh, on Capella. And, and uh, I think, uh, Laurent, you may, you may know a bit more about that. Yes, there are commercial products uh, sold by uh, uh, some companies in the uh, Capella ecosystem. So I will just refer every anybody who's interested to go to the Capella website and uh, see uh, uh, the list of partners and uh, companies who provide uh, software about that. Uh, the second question was, uh, how do you perform simulation? You have mentioned simulation. Uh, a number of times in the presentation, but how do you actually perform simulation from Capella models? So the uh, thank you. I see Pascal is, is asking the question. Um, yeah. Um, and if you want a, a good book on the use of, of Capella, I, I recommend Pascal's book. Um, the um, the simulation is done outside uh, outside uh, Capella, so we haven't done uh, any simulation, and and the reason for that is. Uh, uh, as we were saying, um, we we putting in place a demonstrator uh, for the purpose of showing the interest uh, or the benefits of the approach. Uh, but if we were to develop uh, any simulation, that would be to serve um, 
the need, a, a real tangible need, if you want, um, uh, and not just to demonstrate the benefits because the effort is quite important. Um, so you, you can perform simulation. You, usually, uh, uh, um, at, um, the, the term one model to rule them all was applied or one model is now one model to synchronize them all. Uh, what, what is done traditionally is you've got uh, your system model that uh, uh, you can export from and you can perform a uh, simulation outside. So in the Capella um, uh, environment, there is uh, uh, Citrus, I think, that uh, enables some simulation. There's some uh, simulation that can be done with Simulink as well. So you can do your uh, system analysis in Capella and export uh, your, your elements uh, into uh, a different tool. Okay, thank you. Uh, for, for this uh, demonstrator of yours, did you develop any specific viewpoint or did you use any specific viewpoint or just Capella out of the box? So it, it was just Capella out of the box uh, for, for the same reason uh, I was mentioning before. We uh, um, it's, it's quite an effort to develop uh, add-ons and, um, and if we were to develop uh, add-ons, we, uh, we would do that with um, for a concrete concrete example, I would probably use uh, you know uh, people like Obeo to do it for us. Okay, and so what what are for you the next steps after this demonstrator, uh, so that you, you will uh, disseminate this demonstrator and uh, well make sure it gets known and has impact. What, what are the next steps for you? There's several different places that it could be applied. Um, in the network breakdown we saw earlier, there's every operator has operational efficiency needs. And so that means um, better orchestration close to the network. And that inherently m means having a good model of, of how things fit together um, and, and automate active service activations or service assurance problems. Um, so we, we're going into, that, that's bits close to the network. There's um, bits close to the customer where um, customer management applications, um, there's smarter things that can be learned about the stream of data that's coming through digital interfaces nowadays and, and ways of learning more over time of, of how to contain customer churn, but, but to learn more, you actually have the same problem. You need to be able to um, have models of the, of the metadata that's coming across those interfaces and, and to make the learning effective. And then in the middle is the network service management. Um, one of our next steps um, will be to go in, in that layer in particular into the European Telecommunication Standards Institute, where they've got about 50 working groups. So you could, I've been asked, could you produce a reference architecture? Well, many of those working groups already have reference architectures. Um, communications service providers are awash with, with architectures and reference architectures. The, the trick is um, what, what is the subset of the view that's going to matter to the end user and to the business? Um, We'll probably end up focusing on on bits that deal with some of the um, rather than look historically, look at what's coming next. Um, and so you, you could whether it's in the orchestration space or whether it's some of the boundaries with these solutions morphing a bit where the intelligence is moving out to edge computing areas, um, that's requiring um, collaborations, not just within traditional comm service providers, but collaborations between different kinds of, of deliverers and that creates opportunities. Um, so, so for all the same reasons, we've just skimmed at, at a very high level over um, how, how do we get and seize those new opportunities quickly. Okay, well, uh, once again, thank you very much, John and Fabrice. I think we are out of time for more questions now. So uh, thank you for your great talk and thank you to the audience for the questions and for your time.
John, if you can move to the next slide or last slide, please. Uh, yeah, so I just want to give a quick overview of uh, our upcoming schedule regarding uh, Capella webinars. Uh, by the uh, beginning of June, on June the 9th, at 10 a.m. EST and 4 p.m. CST, we'll have a, a presentation of an energy use case by Victor Richet and Benjamin Baudouin from uh, A System. And around the end of June, on the 25th uh, uh, at 11 a.m. EST, we'll have uh, the presentation of a space use case uh, by Matthäus Schmitz Venturini. Uh, so, a pretty exciting program for the upcoming month. Uh, stay tuned on our mailing list and on the social networks for the registration link. Uh, finally, when you'll be leaving this webinar, we'll, we would be grateful if you can give us some feedback about today's webinar by filling out the satisfaction form uh, that will be sent to you. Um, and please feel free to contact us if you have any questions, of course. Thank you again, everybody, and goodbye. <laughs>